Hi friends, welcome to the cardiology clinicals classes. In this video, I'd like to tell about, uh, teach you about pulse, blood pressure, and JVP. See, these are the important components in cardiovascular system examination. Hence, I'm taking this to a separate module. So, tell me what is pulse? What is the meaning of pulse? Pulse is a Greek word meaning to and fro. Basically, what we feel is the waveform. It is not the blood column. It is the waveform felt by the finger. Okay. So, when the cardiac contraction is happening, okay, that produces a waveform which traverses in the all peripheral direction. Okay, it reaches the carotid first, then your brachial, then femoral, then the radial. Okay, speed of pulse wave is 5 meter per second. Okay, 5 meter per second. Okay. Um, so, what is the pulse we usually palpate? It is the radial pulse. So, how to palpate it? What is the significance? Semi pronate the forearm and slightly flex at the wrist. Okay. And the radial pulse is felt at the uh, lateral to the flexor carpi radialis tendon. It is assessed by a method known as trisection or osseless maneuver. You basically use three fingers. Okay. So, you are index finger, the middle finger, and the ring finger. The first and last fingers occludes the flow from the radial artery and the retrograde flow from the ulnar artery through the palmar arch. And this helps us to assess the vessel wall thickness simultaneously by the middle finger. And it is better if you palpate both the sides simultaneously. What about the rate, your pulse rate? Pulse rate more than 100 is called as tachycardia and pulse rate less than 60 is called as bradycardia. So sinus bradycardia can occur in physiologically in athletes and sleep, pathologically in hypoxia, hypothermia, raised ICP, ICT and uh, exedema, infever, myocardial infarction, sometimes with drugs or heart blocks. Stressed ICT is stressed intracranial tension which can happen with a head trauma leading to a hemorrhage or a head tumor. Okay, these are the conditions which can lead to raised ICT which can directly manifest with sinus bradycardia. Sinus tachycardia occurs physiologically in infants or children, emotion or exertion, pathologically in tachyarrhythmias, high output states, uh, in fact, MI, cardiac failure, hypovolemia or hypotension and drugs which stimulates your beta receptor that is beta agonist or caffeine. Okay. Tell me what is the pulsation, uh, the name of the pulsation if you uh, hear in the interscapular region and in what condition can be heard? Interscapular pulsation. It is also called a Sussman sign which can be heard in coarctation of iota due to the collaterals. Okay. Sussman sign heard in the coarctation of iota due to collaterals formation. What is the respiratory variation of the pulse during inspiration and expiration? What happens to the pulse rate? Okay. So during inspiration, the pulse rate accelerates and during expiration, the pulse rate decelerates. That is decreases. Why is it so? During inspiration, what happens? Your lung expands. So the blood, lot of blood, okay, from the peripheries will be pulled in, okay, through the right side of the heart. Understood? So lungs is expanding. So venous return increases, okay, and all the blood in, enters into the lungs. But what happens to the blood inside the left side of the heart? The amount of blood in the left side of the heart decreases. So what happens? Ultimately, the output, the cardiac output decreases. So in order to compensate for the decrease in cardiac output, the pulse rate increases or the pulse rate accelerates. Understood? So during inspiration, lot of blood will get collected in the lungs. Okay. And the amount of blood in the left side of the heart will decrease. That leads to decrease in cardiac output. That will be sensed by your carotid receptors and that will cause an increase in heart rate to compensate for the decrease in output. So the pulse rate accelerates during inspiration. Whereas during expiration, all the blood from the lungs will enter, will be squeezed into the left side of the heart and that will lead to increase in output. So to compensate for the increase in output, increase in output is also harmful. So the heart rate will decrease. Okay. And systolic blood pressure will fall up to 10 millimeter of mercury. The reason I told before only, okay, lung, the lungs contains a lot of blood, but the left side of the heart contains less blood. So that can cause fall up to 10 millimeter of mercury. What is more than 10 millimeter fall in systolic blood pressure called? Any idea? We'll see in the subsequent slides. Okay. Whereas in expiration, the stall blood pressure increases and JVP falls with inspiration because right side receives more blood, but more amount of blood enters the lungs. Okay. So JVP 
false jvt is basically reflection of the right atrium the volume in the right atrium okay whereas in expiration the jvp will increase second odd sound will be split a2 p2 split will be heard well heard in inspiration whereas both fuses and it will be heard as a single sound during expiration remember in normal individuals s1 is s1 cannot be you know heard as a split sound whereas s2 can be heard as a split sound during inspiration okay what is pulse deficit or apex pulse deficit it is a difference between heart rate and pulse rate it can happen in atrial fibrillation or ventricular premature beats so how can you differentiate between both atrial fibrillation or ventricular premature complex ventricular premature complex the usual pulse deficit will be less than 10 and atrial fibrillation will be more than 10 per minute a wave in jvp will be present in vpc whereas absent in your atrial fibrillation because it is the atrial contraction which contributes to the a wave on exertion the vpc will decrease or sometimes disappear whereas in atrial fibrillation this will persist or increase rhythm will be short pass then a ventricular premature complex will appear occur then there will be a long pass okay whereas here in atrial fibrillation it is variable and chaotic uh, now coming to the rhythm you have to palpate the radial artery for the rhythm it can be regularly irregular or irregularly irregular 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 irregularly irregular the classical example is atrial fibrillation the first diagnosis differential diagnosis to commit in a patient with irregularly irregular rhythm and in your exam case as well the most common diagnosis will be your atrial fibrillation sometimes atrial and ventricular ectopics can also cause an irregularly irregular rhythm regularly irregular rhythm can occur in atrial tachyarrhythmias especially atrial flutter with fixed av block remember it is fixed av block sometimes variable av block can also occur but variable air work will cause an irregularly irregular rhythm okay and ventricular bigemini or trigemini bigemini means one normal heartbeat and one premature heartbeat again one normal heartbeat followed by one premature heartbeat this is called one normal one, one abnormal that is called bigemini whereas one normal when two normal again one abnormal two normal again one abnormal that is called as trigemini okay so these are the rhythms where you can get a regularly irregular rhythm okay so we discussed about the apex pulse deficit right so how will you check for the apex pulse deficit yes if there are two examiners okay two examiners then what one person can check is in the same cardiac cycle both both will one will check the heart rate okay by auscultation and another will check the pulse rate by palpating the radial artery okay so per heart rate and pulse rate simultaneously calculated so the person will tell start and they will count for 60 seconds as soon as 60 seconds are over they will tell stop okay so how much is the heart rate the heart rate will usually be more it can be like 100 and pulse rate will be 80 or 90 like that so more than 10 different suggest that it is an atrial fibrillation so this can be done in the presence of two examiners okay suppose there are only there is only one examiner you are standing in the exams you want to calculate the apex pulse deficit how will you calculate so in that case palpate radial artery and auscultate your apex both together simultaneously okay and count only the missed beats okay this gives the apex pulse deficit understood okay next coming to the volume so volume is our best assessed by palpating the carotid uh, like how can we palpate the carotid and tell that the volume is high or low it is difficult it comes with experience but there is an indirect assessment of volume that is by calculating an accurate blood pressure okay what is pulse pressure pulse pressure is the difference between systolic blood pressure minus diastolic blood pressure okay so this gives an indirect estimate of volume accurate estimate of volume so accurate blood pressure measurement is very 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 important okay and high volume pulse high volume pulse characteristically happen in aortic regurgitation in arteriosclerosis in elderly individuals the arteries will become thick and that will lead to increase in systolic blood pressure and decrease in diastolic pressure okay whereas decrease in your pulse volume can happen in 
uh, aortic stenosis or a mitral stenosis where the output from the heart will be restricted because of the valvular lesion okay normal pulse uh, the pulse pressure is 30 to 60 whereas less than 30 suggests a low volume pulse and more than 60 suggests a high volume pulse okay what about character character is very difficult to appreciate but uh, it also comes with experience so what is a normal character there will be a two waves merged together here okay one is your percussion wave another is the tidal wave percussion wave is because of the uh, like direct output from the heart whereas the reflected waves from the peripheries will cause the tidal wave okay both these waves occur then there will be a notch called dichrotic notch okay then the waveform will descend okay this is the normal wave normal character of the pulse there will be a percussion wave followed by a tidal wave then comes the dichrotic notch okay this is the normal character and it is best appreciated at the level of carotids okay so first most important um, like uh, uh, character which you should remember is pulses parvus et tardis it's also called as anacrotic pulse low amplitude that is called parvus whereas a late peak that is called tardis okay see we saw the previous waveform is like this right whereas here what happens there is a low amplitude takes time to ascend okay then we are late peak see late peak so this classically happens in aortic stenosis pulses parvus et tardis is equal to aortic stenosis okay next comes the bisferians bis means twice and ferians means beating so single pulse wave with two peaks in the systole s1 to s2 is the systole right so during which there will be two peaks peak one peak two so two peaks during systole it is called as bisferians can be felt best in brachial or femoral artery so due to rapid jet of blood going through the aortic valve okay and it can the main reason behind it is bernoulli effect okay bernoulli effect where the rapid stream of jet will cause a decrease in blood pressure surrounding the jet and again the pressure will increase due to the recoil okay so this is called bernoulli's effect so this leads to two peaks during systole can classically happen in as with ar severe ar or hocm hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy okay then severe ar the both the two peaks will be of equal amplitude see this one and this one are equal amplitude whereas in hocm the first peak will be tall the second peak will be less taller okay so this classically happens in your this is also bisperience this classically happens in your hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy okay next comes the pulses alternance what happens is there will be alternating small and large volume in a regular rhythm so how will the pulse to be like when when you feel it first will be larger again smaller larger smaller like that okay so this is larger small so this you can palpate in radial or femoral beat to beat variability in the pulse amplitude and can characteristic happen in severe lv dysfunction or sometimes in hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy okay next pulse is bigemony here a normal beat followed by a premature beat okay and then a compensatory pass okay so this is a characteristic pattern which can be seen in ventricular bigemony or digoxin toxicity okay what happens is there will be a strong pulse alternating with a weak one the second beat is caused by a decreased ventricular filling right because normally the ventricle needs time to fill and because of the premature beat what happens is the filling will be decreased so that will lead to a weak pulse okay and after that pulse what happens is there will be stronger pulse because large amount of filling will be there and a normal beat then a premature beat after that a long pass will be there then comes a normal beat so during this phase there will be less filling of the ventricle whereas during this phase there will be more filling of the ventricle this leads to a stronger beat okay this happens in pulses by gemini what is hypokinetic pulse it is a small weak pulse which can happen in cardiac failure shock mitral stenosis or aortic stenosis basically it's small volume and narrow pulse pressure okay narrow pulse pressure indirectly suggests that it's a small volume pulse right less than 30 of us uh, pulse pressure is equal to small volume pulse this is an interesting thing pulses paradoxes refers to fall in systolic blood pressure more than 10 millimeter of mercury with inspiration we saw previously that up to 10 millimeter of mercury fall in during inspiration is normal for any individual Whereas in pulses paradoxes, what happens is there is more than 10 millimeter fall in systolic blood pressure during inspiration. So this pericardial tamponade can be diagnosed with high sensitivity specificity. Okay, if the pulses paradoxes exceeds 12. Okay, in a patient with already having a large pericardial effusion. Okay, and uh, what are the cardiovascular causes? Cardiac tamponade, constrictive pericarditis, sensitive cardiomyopathy, pulmonary embolism, and hypolipid shock. In pulmonary causes include COPD, acute exacerbation of COPD. Okay, so these are the causes of pulses paradoxes and 
what is collapsing pulse which is also called as water hammer pulse or corrigan's pulse large volume pulse with rapid upstroke and rapid downstroke okay this characteristically happens in first most differential diagnosis is most called in aortic regurgitation then comes your patent ductus arteriosus av fistula rupture sinus of valsalva and thyrotoxicosis okay so what happens is uh, you have to know how to elicit this pulse very important that is very very important okay and another most important thing is why it occurs large volume of blood is pumped out of the heart during the systole okay and the, during the diastole what happens is because the valve is not closing or if there is a fistula the volume of blood which is pumped forwards will come back again to the heart okay so that will lead to a di rapid diastolic runoff okay so this is one reason you have a like rapid peak and rapid downstroke rapid upstroke rapid downstroke okay this is one of the reason and another reason is rapid large volume uh, blood which is pumped forwards will lead to carotid stimulation and cause a vasodilation this is a preventive mechanism it's peripheral vasodilation occur and that will also be one of the reason for this collapsing nature of the pulse this is also called as water hammer pulse or corrigan's pulse okay so how to palpate basically for palpating this collapsing pulse you should use both your hands okay one hand for palpating the radial pulse and another hand to support the arm of the patient okay support the arm remember you should not hold you should not hold it tightly okay basically you should support here uh, this area you have to support with one of your hands and that can help you like that that can help you to elicit the uh, your uh, pulse the collapsing pulse here okay here you will feel the collapsing pulse okay here you have to hold with one hand and other hand to support here okay you should not hold it tightly or you should not hold it here like that okay this is not this is a wrong method you have to hold it below okay below the arm and lift it okay lift it above the head next comes the pulses diacraticus previously we saw bisphereans which means two peaks in systole only whereas here single pulse peak with one peak in systole and one peak in diastole see during the systolic phase there is a one peak and during the diastolic phase diastolic phase is between the s2 and s1 where there is another peak this classically happens in low stroke volume with decreased peripheral resistance okay and this happens in lv failure typhoid fever due to toxins release dehydration dilated cardiomyopathy and cardiac tamponade okay these are the causes of pulses diacraticus one peak in systole and one peak in diastole okay what are the causes of reverse pulses paradoxes just to know the concept is uh, like uh, it is hard to explain so one is a hocm and another is a positive pressure ventilation these are the causes of reverse pulses paradoxes what is pulses paradoxes more than 10 mm fall in systolic blood pressure during inspiration okay reverse pulses paradoxes what happens is inspiratory increase in blood pressure will happen expiratory decrease will happen that happens in hocm and positive pressure ventilation then comes your radio radial delay Radio radial delay can occur in Takayasu arteritis, thoracic outlet syndrome, subclavian steel syndrome, ascending aortic dissection. Very very important. And discrepancy in the blood pressure between the two upper limbs, more than 10 millimeter mercury is significant, and that can suggest a dissection. So in acute uh, chest pain patient, if you can feel a discrepancy, just always have the habit to check both the radial pulses. That can tell you whether there is any acute aortic dissection because dissection can also mimic a myocardial infarction, especially in inferior myocardial infarction ECG changes. Okay, so. I think mean, said the Takai is hot right side. I fondly remember uh, my during my exams. Um, I was answering well, and then uh, my examiner asked, "What are the causes? What are the causes of uh, absent uh, your radial pulse?" Suddenly, my my like I I went blank. Okay, and then my professor, my internal examiner, my professor and HOD and my chief uh, told, "Taka taka na answer sulle." Okay, so basically we use colloquially, "kada kada." That means rapidly. Okay, what he told, taka taka na answer sulle. So that means he wanted to give clue for the taka is hot radius. So this is an important clue which I want to uh, tell you. Basically, if you don't know an answer for a question which your external examiners are asking, then you can see your internal examiner. Sometimes the internal examiner may give you clue by something like this. Okay, right. Then um, radio femoral delay. The classical example is coarctation of aorta. There, uh, there will be a narrowing in the aorta and descending thoracic aorta. So there can be delay in the uh, between the radial pulse and the femoral pulsation okay so condition of the vessel wall is basically by flattening the artery by digital pressure you are giving maximum pressure and flattening the artery then you can slide the blood vessel upwards downwards sideways normal blood vessel will not be palpable if after like after you collapse the artery with the digital pressure and you are rolling it sideways and upwards the normal blood vessel will not be palpable if it is palpable it suggests an arteriosclerosis that is rigid blood vessel it happens in old age okay but because of monkey berg arteriosclerosis Okay, these are the points just to know. Okay, that is uh, condition of the vessel wall. Whether it is rigid, okay, it's um, rigid means 
can suggest an arteriosclerosis can happen in old age okay then comes all the peripheral pulsation felt so we discussed how to check for the radial pulse now comes the brachial pulse it should be palpated in the anticubital fossa medial to the bicep tendon carotid pulse at the angle of the jaw anterior to the sternocleidomastoid remember only one at a time if you palpate both the carotids the patient will go for a syncope okay then femoral just below the inguinal ligament at the mid inguinal point okay mid inguinal point is your midpoint between the anterior superior iliac spine and the and the pubic symphysis okay right so inguinal ligament lies between the anterior superior iliac spine and the pubic tubercle but the you have to palpate the femoral pulse at the mid inguinal point okay that is the midpoint between the anterior superior iliac spine and the pubic symphysis okay and the popliteal pulse it is basically in the posterior in relation to the knee joint you have to flex the knee joint and in the deep crease uh, deep in the crease you have to palpate for the popliteal pulse posterior tibial pulse located 2 cm below and posterior to the medial malleolus okay and dorsalis pedis you can pal palpate best at the groove between the first and second metatarsal it is absent in 10% of the normal individuals okay so absent dorsalis pedis there are there is a normal finding in some individuals okay so now before going into the blood pressure i would like to ask you a basic question uh, this is from our previous topic cyanosis is common in anemia or polycythemia cyanosis that means blue discoloration of skin okay that happened with hypoxia or decrease in oxygen saturation in the blood so that will, that is more common in anemia or polycythemia yes what is the answer so in order to pay a, for a patient to manifest cyanosis okay not for a patient to manifest cyanosis more than 4 g per deciliter of his hemoglobin should be deoxygenated okay this is a very very important thing more than 4 g per deciliter of hemoglobin in the body should be deoxygenated to manifest cyanosis okay and spo2 usually saturation of oxygen less than 85 percentage is necessary for manifesting cyanosis okay so in a patient with severe anemia already the hemoglobin is less than 7 okay so in that case it will take it will be difficult for the patient to deoxygenate all the almost all the more than 4 g per deciliter of the hemoglobin in his body whereas if a patient is having polycythemia already patient is having 16 or 17 hemoglobin okay so 17 g per deciliter hemoglobin so in that case it is easy for more than 4 g per deciliter to your deoxygenate and then that, that is the reason polycythemic individuals are more prone or more easy to manifest cyanosis whereas in severe anemia it is hard to find cyanosis okay this is a practical point you should remember coming to the next most important topic which is blood pressure what is blood pressure basically it is a lateral force exerted by the blood column per unit area of the vascular wall lateral force exerted by the blood column per unit area of the vascular wall best method is oscillometric method it is an mcq as well oscillometric method so as soon as you hear blood pressure an interesting finding which everyone will like to discuss is a korotkov sounds what is korotkov sounds okay there are five phases of sounds when you start measuring blood pressure okay by auscultation you can hear five phases of sounds okay the phase one is the first appearance of clear tapping sound okay tapping sound that is the first phase and that represents the systolic blood pressure okay. phase two is is the tapping sound is replaced by soft murmurs phase three is the murmurs become louder phase 4 is muffling and phase 5 is disappearance and disappearance is equal to diastole rarely in say, some patients with severe aortic regurgitation what happens is the phase 4 sounds can be uh, like uh, heard at some blood pressure like 30 mm of mercury or a uh, 60 mm of mercury and the the there is no disappearance of sound at all okay so the phase 5 will not be there so in that case you can measure mention the bps the systolic 170 bar 30 bar 0 this is the blood pressure of the patient basically you will take the phase 1 and the phase 4 for the blood pressure reading then you can mention the zero okay disappearance of sound doesn't not happen at all so you can mention zero okay so how to measure blood pressure so rest the patient for 5 minutes it is very important that the patient should be seated well okay his uh, back should be supported his arm should be supported his arm should be at the level of heart he should not have taken caffeine or tea or smoking like for the past 30 minutes duration that is very very important otherwise the patient's bp will be shooting up it is uh, always uh, important always good to tell the patient to empty his bladder because 
bladder okay i can even full bladder can increase the blood pressure tight belt wearing in the abdomen can also raise the blood pressure so these are the precautions you can uh, take before measuring the blood pressure to ensure that you are taking a proper blood pressure okay so measure bp in both arms the higher of the two to be taken rest the arm comfortably at the heart level appropriate size cuff very very important point appropriate size cuff and palpate the brachial pulse first method to be uh, you know you employed in measuring blood pressure is your palpatory method that is you will palpate the radial artery or the brachial artery then you will inflate the cuff till the pulse is disappearing okay and then what you will do is you will inflate another 30 mm of mercury then slowly start deflating 1 to 2 mm of millimeter per second okay that should be the speed of deflating while auscultating the brachial artery with your stethoscope okay this is the proper method of measuring blood pressure okay very very important okay don't go ahead and do an auscultatory method before palpating the blood pressure why because of the phenomenon called auscultatory gap. In 20% of the elderly hypertensive patients, what happens is the phase 1 correct off sound can appear in very high blood pressure, like 180 millimeter of mercury, the phase 1 will appear. And there will be disappearance of sounds till 140 or 130, like that. A large gap will be there. And in 130 or 140, phase 2 correct off sounds will be there. Okay, so if you directly go and auscultate the auscultate method you can if you go ahead then you may falsely inflate the cuff till 150 then you will start uh, deflating it you will hear the first sound at 140 millimeter mercury and you will hear disappearance at 80 millimeter mercury you will take this 140 as the actual blood pressure after actual systolic blood pressure of the patient but if you palpate and check then the pulse will actually be uh, disappearing at a higher blood pressure like 180 okay so in order to not do miss this uh, phenomenon the auscultatory gap which can occur in elderly you should always palpate the blood pressure first then you can go for auscultation okay what is white coat hypertension so at least three separate clinic based measurements which are more than 140 millimeter of mercury 140 90 two non clinic based measurements less than 140 or 90 millimeter of mercury in the evidence of in the absence of any target organ damage target organ damage can be kidneys okay or eyes okay so what does it mean basically as soon as he comes to you to your clinic after he checks his blood pressure he finds it very high whereas in his home when he is comfortable or in his office when he is comfortable if he checks the blood pressure there is no high blood pressure at all okay so three office based measurements three clinic based measurements more than 140 90 whereas two non clinical based measurements less than 140 per 90 in the absence very important absence of any evidence of target organ damage will tell you that it is a white coat hypertension okay now tell what is paradoxical hypertension paradoxical hypertension means para patient paradoxically shows an increase in blood pressure even when on antihypertensive drugs how can it occur one example is a patient with a uh, diabetes okay is on beta blocker having hypoglycemia that can cause a shooting up of blood pressure okay that is one example and another is your bilateral renal artery stenosis patient is on ac inhibitor the patient is known to have bilateral renal artery stenosis that will lead to increase in blood pressure paradoxically okay Unilateral renal artery stenosis, the drug of choice is AC inhibitors, but in bilateral renal artery stenosis, this will lead to increase in blood pressure. Okay, and administration of beta blocker in a patient with pheochromocytoma. Okay, the first drug of choice for pheochromocytoma is for as well BP control is phenoxybenzamine, that is an alpha blocker. Then you should give beta blocker for rate control. Whereas instead of that, if you go ahead and start a beta blocker in a patient with pheochromocytoma, it leads to uninhibited alpha receptor stimulation and that leads to paradoxical rise in BP. Okay. And what is orthostatic hypertension? What is orthostatic hypertension? It's basically fall in systolic blood pressure more than 20 millimeter of mercury or diastolic blood pressure more than 10 millimeter of mercury in resumption, uh, assumption to upright posture from a supine posture, uh, upright posture from a supine posture. Understood? When the patient is lying down, fine. Suddenly after the patient gets up, even after three minutes, okay, if the systolic blood pressure is found to be more than 20 millimeter fall or diastolic blood pressure is more than 10 millimeter fall is there then it suggests orthostatic hypotension okay in normal individuals also there will be falling blood pressure that is normal but it can last up to three minutes then the patient's heart will pump and the peripheral vascular resistance will increase and that will lead to optimization of blood pressure but if the fall in the blood pressure in the systolic more than 20 or diastolic more than 10 lasts more than three minutes then it is abnormally it is called as orthostatic hypotension tell me what is masked hy hypertension yes masked hypertension masked hypertension what is masked hypertension when the patient comes to you checks his bp in your clinic okay it is normal whereas in his office or in his home it will be 
increase. This is called as mast hypertension. It is very dangerous because it will be unpicked, like undiagnosed yes, uh, till he reaches the last stage, till he develops a kidney problem or some end organ damage, it will be unnoticed. Okay. This is called mast hypertension. It is a reverse of your, it is opposite of your white coat hypertension. Okay. And hypertensive emergency is there. Okay. Hypertensive urgency is there. Basically emergency, hypertensive emergency is very high blood pressure with E for end organ damage. Okay. So that is called emergency. E for emergency, E for end organ damage. Okay, just remember that urgency is a very high blood pressure without end organ damage. Okay, hypertensive emergency and hypertensive urgency. Now coming to the most favorite part for an examiner, that is your JVP. Okay, what is JVP? It is it conveys jugular venous pressure and waveform. Okay, jugular venous pressure and waveform both are important. So it is a single most important bedside measurement from which we can estimate the volume status of the patient. So how to measure the JVP? It is basically the vertical distance between the peak of JVP, the waveform and the angle of low is plus 5 centimeters. Okay. So you can see the peak waveform in the neck. Okay. And the angle of low, you know, the sternum. Okay. Between the manubrium and the body of the sternum, there will be a, you know, bump that is called your angle of sternum, angle of Louis. So you can add the distance between these two and then 5 centimeter that gives your JVP 5 centimeter of water okay the measure value is, is represented by of water okay and distance more than 4.5 centimeter at 30 degree angulation is considered abnormal when the patient is reclined at 30 degree angulation okay and more than 4.5 centimeter okay above the sternum okay, that tells that the patient's JVP is elevated it is noted in the internal jugular pain okay so how will you measure the JVP these are the very important points to be noted. Best is seen on patient's right side. Okay, so patient supine declined at 45 or 30 degrees. Okay, some books give 30, some books give 45. Okay, mention 30 or 45 as per your teacher's uh, teaching. With the head resting on a pillow and turn slightly to left. Okay, best is seen if the muscles, the stomach at a mass side or whole line skin are relaxed. So the head should be supported, avoid excessive turning or elevation of chin. Look across the patient's neck from the right side. Use oblique lighting with the JVP. JVP is difficult to see. Okay. So this is how uh, JVP is measured. Patient is lying at around 30 degree angulation. Uh, Turn the head to left side. Okay. And it is relaxed. Okay. So usually between the two heads of the sternal kilometer mastite, the internal jugular vein lies. It reaches up to the mastite process here. Okay. So you just have to measure the vertical height in centimeters between the top of the jugular venous pulsation and the sternal angle okay this height should be measured and another 5 centimeter should be added to give you the exact JVP in centimeter of water okay and this height more than more than 4.5 centimeter is abnormal okay so identify the jugular venous pulsation if a pulsation is visualized what you should do immediately you should not go jump and measure the JVP you should do basically confirm whether it is JVP or not. Okay. So how will you confirm? You have to use a method called hepatojugular reflex. You have to press the upper abdomen, the epigastrium or the right hypochondrium for a few minutes. There will be elevation of the JVP transiently. Okay. This is normal. Okay. So that tells you that this is a proper JVP and you can then measure the JVP. Okay. So you have to next identify the waveforms. What are the waveforms normally? Normal JVP, there will be two upstrokes. One is the A wave and V wave and two downstrokes which are called as descents, X descent and Y descent. Okay. We, uh, in theory, describe about a C wave, which is not clinically seen. Okay, it is just a Doppler finding. And how will you identify the waves? You can simultaneously auscultate the S1 and the apex with the stethoscope, or you can palpate the left carotid pulse when you examine the right side JVP. Understood? And uh, remember, the A wave precedes the carotid upstroke. Okay, and the first heart sound. Okay, first the A wave occurs, then the carotid upstroke occurs, okay, or the S1 occurs, then comes the, the next waveform will be your V wave. Only one waveform is seen, then what will be the possible diagnosis? Then the patient might have an atrial fibrillation. So the only positive wave will be your V wave, which follows your carotid upstroke or S1. Okay, so two waveforms are seen. You are not able to differentiate whether it is, it is an A wave or V wave. Then you can try oscillating the apex or you can palpate the left carotid and diagnose whether it is an A wave or a V wave. Whereas if only one waveform is seen, it is PAKA V wave only because A wave can be absent in atrial fibrillation, whereas there is no cause for a V wave to be absent. Okay. So what happens to the venous column when the patient lies down? It will, it will be here. So we cannot measure 
ఓకే ఇంత జేవీపి మరి సో ఇంత పేషెంట్ లైజ్ డౌన్ లైక్ ఇన్ థర్టీ డిగ్రీ ఆర్ ఫార్టీ ఫైవ్ డిగ్రీ యాంగులేషన్ ఓకే దెన్ ద అప్పర్ వీనస్ కలం కెన్ బీ విసిబుల్ దెన్ యూ కెన్ ఈజిలీ మెషర్ ఓకే వెరస్ ఇంత పేషెంట్ సిట్టింగ్ దిస్ అప్పర్ వేవ్ ఫామ్ విల్ బీ లైయింగ్ బిహైండ్ ద క్లావికల్ సో ఇట్ విల్ నాట్ బీ విసిబుల్ ఇన్ నార్మల్ ఇండివిజువల్స్ but remember when a patient is upright when a patient is sitting if you are able to see the jvp that suggests that the jvp is elevated okay so just by sitting and the patient's uh, jvp is visible then it suggests that the jvp is elevated okay right then what is the difference between venous and arterial pulse how will you differentiate between the jvp and carotid pulse so venous pulse there will be two peaks per cycle what are the two peaks one is a a wave and another is a v wave whereas in carotid there will be only single peak per cycle it is better seen than felt whereas this is better felt than seen okay and this can be occluded by proximal pressure the venous is very easy to occlude by proximal pressure whereas this cannot be occluded by proximal pressure located more laterally this is located more medially and this varies in position and respiration whereas arterial pulse will not vary in position respiration okay these are the characteristic differences between your jvp difference between your jvp and your carotid pulse so what are the wave forms okay leave this wave okay this is high fatigue no need so first comes your a wave then comes your x descent then comes your v wave then comes your y descent okay then again comes the a wave then x descent okay so this is the normal wave forms a wave x descent v wave y descent then again a wave okay so what is the reason for the a wave x descent v wave everything we'll see in detail so a wave is because of the atrial contraction so when does it occur it is it occurs at the ending phase of the ventricular diastole okay so the ventricle fills the initial filling will be an active filling then comes the diastasis the slow filling then comes filling because of the atrial contraction during the initial filling phase will be around 80% of the blood from the left atrium will enter into the left ventricle and during the last atrial contraction phase there will be around 15 to 20% blood will be pumped from the left atrium into the left, uh, left ventricle okay that atrial contraction will produce a a wave whereas v wave is because of the atrial filling so that occurs at the end of the ventricular systole okay v wave is basically it occurs during the ventricular systole okay so just remember v wave occurs during the ventricular systole it is because of the atrial filling atrium contracts and empties then the atrium fills that produces the v wave okay c is because of the carotid impacts okay so during the ventricular systole what happens there will be pumping of the blood which can be palpated here in the carotid that is because of the carotid impact there can be a c wave okay then two descents so the atrium is contracting and emptying that causes your a wave then the atrium will relax that causes your x descent then the atrial passive uh, this uh, atrial filling will cause your v wave then the atrial passive emptying will call the uh, cause the y descent understood atrium empties by contracting that causes your a wave then the atrium will relax because it is contracting it will relax that will produce the x descent the atrial filling will cause a v wave and the atrial passive emptying will cause the y descent okay so just to recollect further i would like to summarize in a table as well so a wave atrial contraction x descent is atrial relaxation and descent of av septum this is another point which you can tell c wave because of the carotid impact some people will tell it is because of the bulging of the tricuspid leaflets upward v wave is because of the atrial filling by the venous septum and y descent because of the atrial passive emptying okay so this is the correlation things uh, when it occur at the terminal phase of ventricular diastole a wave will occur so at the onset of ventricular systole there will be x descent during the ventricular systole only c wave will occur because the blood will be pumped during the ventricular systole then v wave will occur at the end of ventricular systole and during the onset of the ventricular diastole the early uh, filling phase the y descent will occur okay have an idea so the a wave is the maximum positivity and the most conspicuous feature is your x descent and it is larger than your y descent okay and the c will cor- correlate with the car- carotids okay and then uh, this v will occur during the ventricular systole and y descent will occur after the opening of the av valves okay so opening of the av valves have an important role in producing a proper y wave y descent okay so now tell me what are the causes of your a wave which is also called as venous corrigans a wave is also called as venous corrigans large a wave canon a waves and absent a waves absent a wave is very simple atrial contraction is contributing the a wave so when the atrium is not contracting properly then it is in especially in conditions like atrial fibrillation will have an absent a wave whereas large a wave can occur in tricuspid stenosis or pulmonary stenosis or pulmonary hypertension so what happens during this uh, tricuspid stenosis or pulmonary stenosis or pulmonary hypertension okay we'll just uh, see how it happens 
So basically imagine this is your heart, okay, your right atrium, left atrium, left ventricle, right ventricle, here comes your pulmonary artery. So here is your superior vena cava, here is your inferior vena cava. So basically the right atrial, uh, your pulsation, your volume status will be reflected in the via the superior vena cava in the form of JVP through the internal jugular vein, right? So if the valve here is stenosed, tricuspid stenosis, or if the valve here, pulmonary artery valve is stenosed, or if the pressure here is very high, what happens? There will be increase in volume here, right? Increase in volume here, okay, and increase in volume here. So that will lead to a large A wave. Understood? So the increase in volume, where all there will be increase in volume in these conditions, a pulmonary stenosis or pulmonary artery hypertension, okay, or when there is a tricuspid stenosis, the volume of blood here will be increased and that will lead to a large A wave. Okay, large A wave. Fine. So next what we are going to discuss, it is the, it is the, your canon A wave, right, canon A wave. So canon A wave can occur in junctional rhythm or AV dissociation. One most important thing to be reminded is your complete heart block. Okay. So what happens, why this canon A wave occurs? Canon A wave is very large A wave. So here in all these conditions we discussed first, the tricuspid stenosis or pulmonary stenosis or pulmonary hypertension, there will be filling, okay. Whereas in canon events to occur, the atrium has to contract against a closed tricuspid valve. So where all this condition can happen? If there is a junctional rhythm, there will be no synchrony between an atrium and ventricle. So what happens is the atrium will pump, at the same time if the ventricle also pumps, the valve leaflet will not open at all. So during the atrium, when the atrium contracts, the blood from the atrium should flow into the right atrium should flow into the right ventricle through the tricuspid valve. But when the atrium and the ventricle simultaneously contracts, the tricuspid valve will not open. So that will lead to a large A wave, which is also called as canon A wave. Okay. And in AV dissociation also, this is the mechanism. Complete heart block also, this is the mechanism. Complete heart block is nothing but a atrium will have its own intrinsic rate and ventricle will have its own intrinsic rate. Okay. And what happens is suddenly when the atrium and ventricle it incidentally pumps together, then the atrium will have to pump against a closed tricuspid valve that will be reflected in the form of a canon A waves. Okay. So large A waves will happen when there is a flow between the right atrium and right ventricle, whereas canon A wave will occur only when there is a complete closure of the valve against the closed tricuspid valve with the atrium contracts that is called a canon A wave. Okay. Fine. So V wave. V wave is prominent in tricuspid regurgitation. Okay, tricuspid regurgitation, what happens when the, during the systole, the blood from the right ventricle will enter into the right atrium. So what is, what is the reason behind V-wave? We discussed already, A-wave is the atrial contraction, then the atrial relaxation ca causes the X descent, okay, then the atrial filling will cause the V-wave, then the passive emptying will cause the Y descent, remember. So this atrial filling phase, during the atrial filling phase, the blood from the right ventricle also enter the right atrium. So that will lead to prominent V wave, very large V wave that happens in tricuspid regurgitation. Okay. So in, you know, severe TR, what happens is there will not be any exodescent at all. From here only there will be, uh, from here only there will be a V wave. Okay. That is called CV wave. CV wave is seen in tricuspid regurgitation because there will, when, when the atrium is relaxing, the blood from the ventricle will hit here. Okay. So we will go inside the right atrium that will lead to no X descent at all. So that will lead to CV waves that happens in severe tricuspid regurgitation. Okay. And X descent, so it's also called a systolic collapse. So this can be prominent in constrictive pericarditis and cardiac tamponade. Okay. Remember these two conditions, constrictive pericarditis and cardiac tamponade. It can be absent in early tricuspid regurgitation, early sign of tricuspid regurgitation. I told tricuspid regurgitation, what happens is the blood from the right ventricle will enter into the right atrium. So there will not be any dip in the waveform between the A and B. Okay. So that uh, actually X descent will be absent. Blunting of X descent can also happen in atrial fibrillation. Why? Only when there is a good atrial contraction, there will be a prominent A wave followed by an X descent. Whereas when the atrial contraction is not there, there will be wave like this. Understood? So this positive wave, uh, big wave will be produced by the atrial contraction. When it is absent, the wave will be very small like this. Those blunting of X descent can happen in atrial fibrillation. Okay. And Y descent is also called as diastolic collapse. Blunted Y descent. When does it occur? Basically Y descent is because of the passive filling of the right ventricle. 
So it can be blunted when there is a stenosis of the valves or a right atrial myxoma, tricuspid stenosis or right atrial myxoma. Absent OI descent is characteristically seen in cardiac tamponade. We, dis we discussed that there will be prominent X descent in constrictive pericarditis in cardiac tamponade. But remember, absent Y descent is equal to cardiac tamponade. Rapid prominent Y descent occurs in uh, your constrictive pericarditis, which is also called as Frederick's sign. Okay. In constrictive pericarditis, what happens is the early filling will be unaffected, whereas the late filling will be affected. Okay. So the filling will end with a pericardial knock. Okay, pericardial knock. The pericardial knock is like an S3, which happens during the diastole after the S2. Okay, so what happens is there will be early good filling of the right ventricle, but suddenly it stops. Okay, so that will produce a prominent Y descent. Okay, rapid prominent Y descent, which is also called as Frederick sign. Very important question, often liked by examiners. Okay, and if a patient has an A wave and C wave, which are both equal in amplitude, then it is it is caused by ASD. Just uh, for an MCQ purpose, just remember this. Okay, then Kussmaul sign. What is Kussmaul sign? The venous pressure should fall normally by at least 3 mm of mercury with inspiration. We discussed already, right? Inspiration, what are the changes? Inspiration, the heart rate will increase. Okay, the blood pressure will fall, but it is less than 10 mm of mercury. And the JVP also will fall by at least 3 mm of mercury. Kussmaul sign is defined by either a rise or lack of fall in the JVP with inspiration. It can characteristically happen constrictive pericarditis, restrictive pocardiomyopathy, pulmonary embolism, RV infarction or advanced cell systolic failure. This you can leave it. Just remember these four reasons. Okay, but remember there is an MCQ asked often here. Okay, this Kussmaul sign can never happen in cardiac tamponade. Okay, Kussmaul sign can never happen in cardiac tamponade. Okay, and few words about abdominal or jugular reflex. Basically, we did this maneuver to confirm that the view waveform which we are visualizing here is Paka JVP. So, when you press the right upper quadrant or the epigastrium, there will be transient rise in the waveform here. Okay, your JVP will transiently rise, but it will fall, it will come back to normalcy because the right atrium will accommodate more blood, the ventricle will accommodate the increasing quantity which is which the ventricle is receiving, okay, because of the increased pressure in the abdomen. But if there is persistence, persistence elevation of JVP more than 15 seconds okay normally this will last the increase in thing will last less than 15 seconds okay then the atrium everything will accommodate the waveform will return to normal height here whereas when there is more than 15 second persistent elevation in the jvp as long as you press the abdomen then it suggests a right heart failure okay that is abdominal jugular reflex inference okay what are the things which you can get one is you can confirm that it is a jvp then you can check whether there is a failure or not okay so where do you get non pulsatile JVP? It can be uh, there in so a superior vena cava obstruction. Basically, JVP is conveyed by the internal jugular vein, superior vena cava, then the right atrium, right? So in a superior vena cava obstruction, you can have a non pulsatile JVP. If there is massive right sided effusion, that are there also you can get a non pulsatile JVP. So with this, we have come to the end of the module. So we have discussed about the pulse, blood pressure, and JVP. All these three components are very important. The examiner will ask these questions initially. Then after assessing your strengths, he will go ahead with the other questions pertaining to the case. So remember these things are very, very like uh, basic things which you should be thorough with. Okay. Uh, so thank you one and all.